Good morning, friends. So there's all kinds of stuff going on here at King Street. We are in our last few seconds of summer. And so coming up on the 10th, we have Rally Sunday. And again, Carolyn and Dick, it is just wonderful to be able to have the service and the picnic at your place. It is such a wonderful gift that you offer us. We are grateful. Um, so for all of us who are going to Carolyn and Dick's on the 10th, you're going to want to bring a lawn chair because you could sit on the grass, but you might want a lawn chair. Um, but it's also our picnic. So make sure you bring one of those things that you want to show off to the whole gathered congregation. My mother-in-law accuses me of having gone into ministry just for the potluck suppers. <laughs> I'm not sure she's quite correct, but she's not quite wrong either. Um, so yes, the 10th is coming up rapidly. The 17th, uh, I believe we're on track to start our Sunday school program. I'm seeing a nod back there. Is, is Yes, probably, maybe. Beth isn't here at the moment, so. But I believe 17th is the start for our Sunday school program. I'm also looking to have an adult ed program kicking off in the fall. Um, you know, back pre-pandemic, we used to get together once a month for an adult conversation around a particular topic, and we will be doing it again. It's, it's nice to take the, these next steps in the world of normalness, or normalcy, as the former president put it. Um, but yeah, so make sure that you're ready on the 17th for that. Um, we have got uh, a guest preacher who's scheduled to come in in October when I'm away, uh, which is going to be great to have uh, Michelle Wilcher Clements here on, I think that's the 17th or something like that. Um, so, I, you know, I'm doing my own travel plans and trying to make everything mesh up. So lots of good stuff that way. Um, looking backwards, uh, yesterday was our time serving at Dorothy Day, and I believe you were telling me that we had like some insane number of people that we served, like a hundred and... Yeah. So 115 folks served, and did we give out sandwiches as well, like we usually do? That's such such a wonderful way to be of service. Okay, well, thank you. And, and thank you to any of you who were there participating in that. It is a great shared ministry that, you know, we share with other congregations who do the same thing when we partner together. Um, other things coming up, anything that we need? Do you have any announcements up there? Anything from the congregation? Okay, I don't see anybody raising your hand. I don't see anything coming in over Zoom. In that case, let me turn it over to you for our call to worship. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Our help is from God, who made heaven and earth. Come to worship the one who answers our prayers. If God were not on our side, we could not live. If God were not for us, we would be swept away. God has gifted each one of us in unique ways. In our variety, we complement one another. We rejoice in God's love and faithfulness. Blessed be our God, whose word is true. In thankfulness, we bring our joyous songs. We are here to pay attention to God's instructions. We are here seeking to discern God's will. We are open to God's transforming spirit.
Would you remain standing as we join together in our prayer of invocation? God beyond our knowing, we believe that you care for humble people who seek to follow your word more than those who are pretentious and proud in places of power. You have protected your people when they were surrounded by trouble. You have provided a way of escape in the midst of oppression. Your love never fails. Come, Holy One, to transform us. Work within and among us to renew our minds and build community. Nurse us into the health you intend for all your children. You are our help and our hope. Amen. Would you please be seated? As we reflect on our lives, we see all of those places where we have gone off the rails. We find those places where we need to be put back so that we can live as God's own people. And so we pause and we offer God our prayer of confession. Not because we're telling anything that God doesn't already know, but we're opening ourselves to receive that gift of grace that God stands ready to pour out upon us. Let us then offer our prayer together. O oh God, we did not realize that we are among the rich oppressors of this world. We think we are poor when we cannot have everything we want. Keep us from misusing the power we have. We confess our fear of those who are unlike us. We set up barriers against them when we are afraid. Keep us from acting in ways that alienate and divide. When we are attempted to conform to the world's standards, set before us the higher model of sacrifice and service that is given to us in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, the good news today, as always, is that we are a forgiven people that we dwell in God's grace and that God pours out that grace for us as often as we need it. No, even more often than we need it. The gift is lavished upon us. And so I declare to you that we are indeed forgiven, that we're set free and that we're given the strength and the power to live as God's very own people in right relationships with God, with one another and with all creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. As the adults take your seats, let me invite the children forward for our time together. Good morning. So rumor has it that you two might be kind of sleepy this morning. You, know, you stayed up awfully late last night after that party that we had with everybody at your house. Lots of really good music. Now, you were telling me yesterday that tomorrow is a really important day for you guys. It's the first day of school, just in case you haven't caught that. And for Gloria, you've done this before. You're an old hand at going to school. For Gabe, this is the first day of kindergarten. So, so yeah, that, that's exactly how I would feel, too. <laughs> So tomorrow's a big day, and when you're in school, your teacher will probably ask you some questions. And what do you do when the teacher asks a question? Um, so is our school, mm -hmm. um, we raise our hands and the teacher calls on something. Yeah, that's a pretty standard way of doing things. The teacher asks a question, and the students who know the answer raise their hands, and then uh, 
that they get called on, and hopefully they were correct. I guess you could always raise your hand and be wrong. Now, you know what happens if you don't raise your hand? Now, we have some teachers here, and they'll tell you what happens if you don't raise your hand. You get called on anyway sometimes. <laughs> because the teacher wants to make sure that you're paying attention, that you're connecting, that you're ready, that you have, have learned all the things you need to learn. And so whether you raise your hand, which of course is the best way to do it, or not, you're probably gonna get asked some questions. Now, in today's reading from the gospel, we have a story of Jesus asking his disciples a question. He says, who do the people say that I am? Now, if someone asked you who Jesus was, what would you tell them? Want to take a guess? A kind person. That, that, and that is true. Gabe, do you have any idea who Jesus is? Can you like sum it up in like one sentence or less? No, you're really sleepy this morning. This is what happens if you stay up late, 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 and then get up early for church. Well, some of the people, some of the disciples were saying, well, you know, the people are saying that you're Moses, or you're Elijah, or you're one of the prophets who's come back to life. Because everyone was hearing Jesus and all the things that he was telling them. And that's what they were guessing. But then Jesus asked his friends, he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter, who was one of the, the most important disciples, he was the one who was in Jesus' very, very close circle of friends. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you have said correctly. And upon this rock, I will build my church. When Peter was asked a question, he raised his hand. He was ready with that answer. He had been paying attention. And so you're going off to school and you're going to have lots of questions to answer. But here at church, we have questions too. And I hope that as you grow up, as you learn your Sunday school lessons, as you continue to learn more about the faith that we share about Jesus, that you too will say that Jesus is the Son of the living God and that you will be able to build on that rock too. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for Peter and his answering questions. We ask that you would help Gloria and Gabe and all of us answer the questions when posed to us. Help us tell the truth of who you are and how we know you. Amen. You guys can go on back to your seats. Our first scripture lesson this morning is from Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 through chapter 2, verse 10. The Israelites are oppressed. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over, to, over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the, Egypt, so the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? 
The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get, a, get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Our reading from the New Testament is from Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. <clears throat> Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Would you pray with me? Speak to us, holy God, so that we can hear a word that changes how we live in this world. Amen. When we think about the stories of our faith, we so often think about Jesus being Christians, that makes sense. We think about the disciples and all that they did. Sometimes we think back to the Hebrew scriptures, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Sometimes we'll think about some of those other heroes of faith, people like Samson, who, when you actually read his story, he wasn't such a great guy, but, you know, he was one of the judges of Israel and, you know, certainly had that, that whole, um, you know, killing the Philistines thing that he was so darn good at. We think about people like King David. But, you know, there's a problem with that list, isn't there? <laughs> And the problem is the Y chromosome. We tend to think of the men as those bearers of history, as the ones whose stories bear retelling. Ladies, this one's for you. Parenthesis, there's a lot of women's stories in the Bible, if only we tell them. But today we find a story that's almost entirely women. We have Pharaoh, who stands out as the, the big exception. But you know, I think it's okay to cast a guy as the bad guy in the story. He's watching the Hebrew people. You remember last week, we had Joseph who welcomed his brothers and his father and all of their families into Egypt, who was preparing for them so that they could survive the famine that was in the land. We turn the page from Genesis to Exodus. We move from the stories of those patriarchs and matriarchs 
And we come to the story of the Hebrew people themselves. Living in Egypt under Pharaoh. We hear of Pharaoh's concern about this people who are growing mighty in number. His concern that there's so many of them, they might rebel and take over Egypt. And so he enslaves them. And he goes a step further. As he commands the midwives, telling them, if a boy is born, kill it. Right there. Strangle it. The minute it's born. But let the girls live. Pharaoh had a long-range plan. He wanted to make sure that there would be no men of military age who could take him on in a few years. He wasn't so concerned about the girls. Oops. So there's these two midwives, Shifra and Pua. And if you haven't named your children Shifra and Pua, it's probably already too late. But these are names that I wish we heard more of because they're great heroes of faith. Because these young women who are delivering the next generation, they brought those baby girls into the world, cradled them in their arms, handed them to the mother. They brought the baby boys into the world, cradled them in their arms, and handed them to the mother, completely ignoring what Pharaoh had told them to do. Well, Pharaoh, realizing that all these boys are still in existence, calls them in. Now, it's not often that the dictator of a country talks to two midwives to ask them what the heck is going on. But that's what he does. So tell me, ladies, what's up here? And those women, oh, they lie. The Hebrew women, they're not like Egyptian women. They are so strong. They give birth, and then they're back up working before we even get there. It's a great story. Not exactly true, but a great story. So they have just explained their way out of this trouble that they would be in if the truth had been known. That they were delivering little little baby boys and not killing them. Well, Pharaoh, realizing that this isn't going to work if the Hebrew women are quite so strong and vigorous, decides that the next thing to do is to order that all the baby boys be killed. Now, if you're thinking, hold it, doesn't the Gospel of Matthew have another story about the king ordering that all the baby boys be killed? Yeah, it does. This is one of those stories that echoes across the ages. Pharaoh gives the order. And then we have the story of one particular family with a brand new baby boy doing some subversive thinking, trying to figure out how could they possibly save the life of this son of theirs. And so the women decide that they need to make a basket, that they need to tar it up so that it'll float and not leak, that they need to put this baby in it and push it out into the Nile. Now, I don't know if you have ever been to the Nile. I certainly haven't. But my understanding is that there are crocodiles in the Nile and that pushing a little basket out is perhaps not the best thing to do. I remember many years ago, my family was on vacation down in Louisiana and we took an airboat tour of one of the bayous And our guide brought along a bag of marshmallows. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but apparently alligators love marshmallows. And so he would chuck one out on the water and it would float there. And the alligator seeing it come up and just chomp right down on it. I suspect that crocodiles are very similar in their approach to things that are floating in the water that might look tasty. And so they don't just push this basket with a baby way out into the Nile, but they leave it 
tight in among the rushes. And then the baby's sister watches it. I'm sure that had a crocodile gotten anywhere near it, she would have been snatching that basket right back out. But she watched as Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe. Now, when Pharaoh's daughter finds this basket, she, well, as, as people do, she said, hey, it's a baby, <laughs> and picked it up and cuddled it, as we do with babies, whether they're ours or not. And in that moment, in that moment of picking up the child, oh, her heart, it was connected. And that's when the baby's sister pops up, having been watching from the rushes. Would you like me to find someone who can nurse that child for you so you can keep the baby? It's that problem that, you know, when, when, the, when the cat wandered into our campsite so many years ago, and I told my wife, if you don't feed it, it'll go away. And then turkey, and we got a cat. It's the same thing that happened with this little baby who didn't have a name yet. But yes, that, that connection, that, that wanting to take care of it, that finding a woman to nurse the child when Pharaoh's daughter couldn't. Little sneaky trick there. Bringing the baby's own mother to be the nurse. These women in this story, they are subversive. I expect that even Pharaoh's daughter didn't go through this whole thing in ignorance, didn't think, what do you know, it's a random child. She knew that this was a little Hebrew kid. Her heart was taken. She fell in love with a baby. And in doing so, she fell in love with a people. We know this story of Moses drawn from the bulrushes, giving that name Moses because he was drawn from the water. It's the beginning of a, another whole set of subversive stories. But it celebrates all of these women, Shifra and Pua, Moses' mother and sister, even Pharaoh's daughter herself. Every last one of them knew exactly what they were doing in subverting Pharaoh's will in saving this child from destruction. In our lives, we don't often find ourselves in places where standing up to power is called for. Not often, it does happen. We'll march, we'll protest, we'll vote. We do all of these things as part of our civic engagement. But I think of Shifra and Pua, those women who were in a position to actually do something, even though they were breaking the rules to make this baby's life better, or in this case, to make this baby's life possible. When you go through your lives, day in and day out, I trust that you always try and do the things that are right. But I want to encourage you to try and do some things that are subversive. Some things that break the rules in a good way. That when you come up against some injustice that's being enshrined by power, maybe you can't stand up and say, that's wrong. Maybe you can, and if you can, you should. But maybe you can't. Possibly, though, you can do something that twists things. You can tell that holy lie that saves someone. You can do the thing that no one expects you to do that makes someone else's life better. We don't see it so often, but when we look back over history, we certainly see times 
when things are ratcheted up in the danger level. I was talking with one of my Eucharistic ministers just this past week. She grew up in Italy, in a town that was occupied by the SS during the Second World War. And she told me the story of a Jewish family who took up residence with the priest in town and how all of the families sent their children to go talk to the priest and in those conversations to hand off some baskets of food. Sometimes that's just what we need to do. To remember that, you know, first off, if, if the Nazis ask you if you have any Jews hiding in your closet, the answer is no, even though the reality should be yes. If you find yourself reaching out and caring for someone who's on the margins and society is pushing them away, draw them back in. Sometimes we'll face some consequences for that. And I know for Gloria and Gabe starting school, they're going to have to be dealing with some of those complex issues of how do the kids deal with each other at the lunch table? We do that too, don't we? But as adults, it's so much more complex. So this week, find some way that you can make a difference. Some way that you can be a little subversive if you need to. And if you can find some lie that you can tell that is a holy lie, oh, by all means do it. That's what we're called to do, is to live as God's own people, protecting not only ourselves, but others through whatever power it is that we may have. May we then be blessed as we live out that protective life, as we look out for those babies in our midst and those foreigners and those who are oppressed, in all of that, may we find our spirits fulfilled and may we find ourselves blessed. Amen.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for your love that has been poured out on us, that has gotten us through challenging times. We give you thanks for those people who have in the past gone to the mat for us, and we ask that you would help us as we provide care to others. Help us to use the power that we have, the power to change unjust systems when we find them, the power to be subversive sometimes. Help us look after the needs of all of your children. We give you thanks, O oh God, for these young ones in our life, for Owen, celebrating his 12th birthday. And we ask that you would be with him and with all of his family as they go through this next year. We give you thanks for Emma celebrating her 20th birthday. And we put in a little parenthetic comment, how the heck did that happen already? We ask, oh God, that you would bless Emma that you would bless her family as she continues to grow into the woman that you have called her to be. We ask your blessing for Ilana, starting at a new school, that you be with Gabriel and Gloria as they too start back to school, that you be with all of the kids who are facing this stressful time of transition. And we ask your blessing for their teachers, for the administrators, for all of those who are doing the work of educating them. We ask that you would grant not only knowledge, but wisdom and compassion. We ask your blessing, O oh God, for Aaron, facing surgery this week, having her tonsils and adenoids out, we ask that you be with Matt as he has a heart catheterization tomorrow. We ask your continued blessing for Heather and Emily's mom as she continues to recover from her surgery last week. And we ask your grace for Frank with a new ALS diagnosis. We ask your blessing for his daughter, Amy, for all of his family as they surround him with their love and as they help him move forward. We give you thanks that Bailey has a new job and we ask that you would help her as she moves forward, taking on the responsibility that that entails, that you would bless her with a sense of accomplishment and joy in her work. We join with Taylor's family in mourning his death so unexpected, we ask your consoling presence with all of them. And we ask that you would be with all of your people, that you would help us to get along with one another, to value each other, to not only tolerate, but to celebrate one another's differences. We pray, O oh God, for those who are living in the reality or the threat of violence. We continue to lift up the people of Ukraine as they fight for their nation's freedom. We lift up the people of Russia, particularly as they oppose the workings of their leader. And extra particularly, as they have just this week seen another demonstration of his ruthlessness. We pray for the people of Sudan and Haiti. 
We ask your blessing for those around the world who are suffering the effects of natural disasters. And we recognize, O oh God, that those natural disasters all have a human component. Help us as we address the issues of climate change, social inequity. Help us as we care for one another and for the planet you have given us to inhabit. We pray for ourselves as well, O oh God, knowing that you know our needs, even before we speak them. And so we offer you our most intimate prayers in the quiet of this moment. Hear our prayers, O God, and bless us. For we offer our prayers as your loving children, in faith, in trust, in hope, and in the name of our brother, Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God invites us to observe the misery of our sisters and brothers who live in oppression and poverty. We have the resources to help make a difference in their lives. Beyond the limits of charity, we are challenged to invest our lives for the mutual benefit of all God's children. Let us give as God has blessed us with joy. We will now receive the morning offering.
expression of genuine love that reflects your love for us, O oh God. We seek to honor you as we serve one another in Christ's name. We reach out to overcome evil with good. Direct our use of the resources you entrust to us that we may not only contribute to the needs of the saints, but also devote our lives to the building of a peaceable, worldwide community in which all are valued. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let us look for places where we can challenge those in power directly or slightly. But let us go to do God's work in the world. And as we go, let us go forth in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of God, and in the power and communion of the Holy Spirit who is indeed with us, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. 